slide. A little bit about IDEX Solutions. We've been around since 1996. We're a Dassault Systems uh, certified reseller and certified education partner. We uh, provide complete solutions around product lifecycle management in the way of support and service of the Dassault Systems solutions. We do implementation services and help desk support. We help customers with customizations and help them do process development, automation, and we do training as well. We also have an engineering services group that helps with on-site staffing and process consulting and um, sort of job offloading. Next slide. The next slide is my agenda. Yeah, which we can't see yet. Well, that's because I was going to go through it, but if you would like to. I will gladly turn the conversation and the presentation over to Wes Russell, who is our NC Manufacturing Resource for IDEX Solutions, and actually one of the best resources in the country. So with that, I'll turn the whole program over to Wes. All right, Susan, thank you. Thanks, everybody, for joining. Uh, good morning. I'm Wes Russell, and uh, I'm going to try to keep this within the uh, allotted time frame this morning. I have a habit of... Uh, running over, so we'll see if I can not do that today. So uh, as far as the agenda goes, a um, few points I want to run through here. I thought that since this is the first presentation I have done on V6 automation, I've done a number of them on V5, uh, I thought it would be a good place to start with a question that is frequently asked to those who have not been exposed to automation. Uh, the next logical question from there is then why we use automation, uh, what benefits it adds to users. Uh, next we will take a look at uh, the main characteristics um, for um, which are new in V6 as, as that's compared with V5. And then we will discuss the supported languages that are available in V6. That list has expanded over V5. And then furthermore, we will uh, look at some considerations for migrating V5 automation uh, to V6. Furthermore, we'll look at the uh, Visual Studio tools for applications, commonly referred to as VSTA. And we'll go further into VSTA and look at um, how to create VST, uh, VSTA library in the uh, ANOVIA database. Then we will uh, see how to access the V6 automation documentation and take a look at some of the in information within that documentation. Uh, from the documentation, we will look at some of the uh, differences in scripting syntax between uh, V5 and V6. And uh, finally, I will demonstrate a few, uh, three I believe, um, uh, V6 automation programs. All right, so with that, we will move on to uh, our first slide, which is what is automation? So there are many things that we could say about what automation is, and I've tried to uh, break this down to a uh, minimal statement here. So think of automation as capturing the use of one or more functions, parameters, inputs, and events into a software program uh, with logic that can be edited and re-executed. So it is very productive when it's necessary to reach the desired uh, goal many times with different inputs. And then furthermore, the logic within the program can modify the results based on these varying inputs. Uh, the automation program can simulate user activity, and you can replay the steps exactly over and over again. So basically, we get down to the point where uh, we simply click run to uh, perform that task uh, repetitively. So next. Why do we use automation? 
Uh, within CATIA, there are um, a variety of ways to capture know-how. Uh, some of those tools available uh, in the simplest form, parameters and formulas, can be used uh, for some cases, and they're available in every workbench. Uh, power copies add additional functionality to uh, capture know-how. Uh, additional knowledgeware tools uh, capabilities are, it can be added, however, these require additional licenses. So in terms of automation, it's available in nearly all the products within the DS suite of products. Um, and it doesn't require additional licenses for the uh, automation functionality. Uh, that being said, however, uh, we need to note that the uh, products containing the functions being accessed by automation are required. So, for example, if I want to access a function that is in the Generative Shape Design Workbench, uh, it's required that the GSD license is active when, um, when the script is run. So you, you can't bypass licensing by performing automation, but providing the licensing is available uh, those, you know, you can access those functions uh, actually even without switching workbenches. Uh, in the uh, the end result is typically we want to increase productivity. So running a script uh, will perform a task very very efficiently. Uh, they run in far uh, they run far more quickly than a user can access the same functionality. In most cases, automation, automation scripts are used for tax, tasks that are performed frequently. Um, for example, um, we could use a script to create a drawing border and title block. So everyone that creates a drawing, a drawing requires a uh, border and a title block. And every company typically has a uh, standard format. So an automation script can be created to uh, create that border and title block exactly the same each time the script is run, and generally it only takes a few seconds. Um, matter of fact, that's such a common task. There's a, a few scripts that are delivered with CATIA for that task, although nobody runs the, the default uh, scripts from Dassault. However, um, it, you can read through those scripts and customize them uh, to your own purposes. And then uh, the other considerations to make here is that we want to uh, add functionality. So automation scripts can be used to add this functionality that's not built into to CATIA or Delmia, uh, whichever the products that you're using. One example of this that I've seen many times is the ability to read data from an external file. Uh, the file could be a spreadsheet or it could be a data file. Uh, maybe it's output points generated from a coordinate measuring machine. Uh, most scripts developed for this functionality not only read the data, but also create geometry from the results. So that geometry that they create can be in the form of points, lines, curves, surfaces, or even uh, solid objects for that matter. Uh, another example along these lines is the ability then to uh, transfer data between applications. So you can extract data from CATIA objects and write that to uh, that data into ex an external application, such as any of the Microsoft Office products. Um, you know, Excel is uh, one that's commonly used, but you could, if you wanted to write into um, a Word document or a PowerPoint presentation, or for that matter, you wanted to uh, create a PDF file of uh, output information from CATIA. So those are just kind of uh, various reasons why would we would want to uh, write automation scripts. Okay, um, then moving on, we're going to take a look at uh, the, the um, what's new in the V6 automation. So the main change that um, hopefully everybody realizes at this point is that uh, within V5, our data model was uh, document-centric, and V6 now replaces that document-centric model uh, 
which relied on files in the operating system with a uh, product representation model relying on a database, and it uses a client-server architecture. So we use the Inovia database, and all of our data uh, we access um, and read it from the database, or when we're uh, after we've modified uh, things, we write them back into the database, and that includes the automation programs. Um, they once you, once created, they exist inside of Inovia as well, and we access them from there. So documents and files again are replaced with product references and instances in the, the V6 scenario. Uh, there's query capabilities and save capabilities where uh, these are we're accessing the database when we perform queries and save operations are, are uh, from the user interface standpoint are called propagation or propagate. And then as the so termed it, um, which is where I got this text, that there's an entity relation based uh, data model that reduces storage size. And so far I haven't found how to really find the size of the data within the database. However, I know if I export data to uh, 3D XML, if I want to move that data between systems, um, those files are actually quite small, surprisingly small, compared to the size of the data files that we used within V5. Okay, so new with uh, V6 automation then, parts now support multiple representations, which are enabled by uh, through isolation between the part reference and its shape. As a matter of fact, parts now can have multiple references within a part. An example of that, a uh, good one that I can think of would be the case of a spring, where if you are designing a compression spring, that spring has a length in its designed form. However, when it's installed into an assembly, it's under compression, and the, the overall length is now shorter. So within the same part, you can have representations that um, that define or that show the uh, spring in its design state and also in its installed state. So you can have multiple representations within that part. Uh, each PLM entity is assigned a unique identifier. Uh, whatever the PLM uh, operation is, and it supports then uh, versioning and configuration and replication. So uh, that's all accomplished through Anovia as well. Moving into the uh, supported scripting languages, uh, the scripting languages in V6 supports all of the uh, supported languages that were available in V5. Um, so those were cat script, which uh, the cat script functionality, uh, it's an interpretive language. The, within cat script, you uh, do not have to formally declare or type variables. Um, and so uh, that again, that's con that uh, functionality will will uh, work in V6 as well. Then there's um, or actually the script uh, cat script by the way is typed variables. Whereas I got those two uh, inverted here. So the the Visual Basic scripting er editor is the one that uh, where you do not need to declare or don't declare. Uh, any variables uh, in order to use them. So then that's uh, referred to as a uh, VB script or VBS. Uh, both of those uh, scripting languages, cat script and VB script, uh, don't support any you know, type of user interface other than you can have an input box and a message box as output. As we move down to uh, Visual Basic for Applications, or VBA, uh, one of the advantages of VBA over the uh, CAT script or VB script is the ability to create uh, interfaces within uh, VBA. And Microsoft Office products all support uh, VBA as well. So the other advantage of using Visual Basic for Applications is the fact that uh, we can t we can uh, talk 
or move data between two different applications that support VBA. So again, a common example there is um, within CATIA, you can have a VBA application that accesses an Excel spreadsheet, reads data, and brings it into CATIA, or vice versa. You can uh, access data from CATIA and write that back out into a spreadsheet. Then new to V6 is the Visual Studio Tools for Applications, or we refer to that as VSTA. Uh, VSTA, again, is new in V6. VSTA supports both uh, VB.NET and C Sharp languages. So both of those languages are available in Microsoft uh, Visual Studio. Um, C Sharp is a new one in terms of support by CATIA. Uh, I have used VB.NET in, in CATIA v5 for some time. Uh, it, it allows you to develop um, more complex user interfaces than you can with, uh, with VBA. Uh, there's more tools available in that regard. We're going to uh, then look further at uh, the VSTA tools here in a minute. So then migrating V5 macros into V6, uh, as was the case in V5. Before you create macros, or in this case even migrate macros from V5 to V6, um, you need to um, come up with uh, a minimal understanding of the uh, concepts of V6, the architecture, uh, and the objects that you're going to access in V6. And, uh, and V6 products. So that was pretty much the same case within V5. If you didn't understand how to create those objects uh, interactively, it was very difficult then to automate that task. Uh, choose the target language in V6. We still, again, have the CAT script and VB script as well as uh, VBA. Now we have uh, both VB.NET and C Sharp languages to choose from. Again, understand the main modifications. And then uh, within V6, depending on the, um, the level that you're at, um, V6 is still evolving. So certain functionalities, as, as newer releases come out, support additional data. So it's important to uh, understand what your installed release supports, uh, whether it supports the data that you're trying to migrate from V5, and uh, understand the details of those modifications. In the in the V6 documentation, they refer so refers to uh, V6 macros persistency. But basically, what that means is that since the macros now are not in files, but they're accessed through the database, uh, to make those macros persistent or available uh, to to all of the client users. The, uh, the macros, again, have to be saved and accessed from the database, so you have to create libraries to store uh, the macro data in the PLM server database. Uh, V6 macros, um, you, in a lot of cases, you would create a V6 macro for each V5 macro that you want to uh, migrate, and you can then export the the uh, macro data from V5 and import that into the uh, macro in V6. Uh, V6 macros cannot support saved uh, macros which are saved in uh, representations. By the way, representations is a V6 terminology, um, but what it means there is in V5 we had the ability to save macros inside of part documents. Uh, that's no longer the case within V6. So uh, if you're migrating V5 macros into V6, which were saved inside of part documents, you first need to export them from the V5 document and then create the V6 macro and import them into 
uh, a macro which then will exist on the database. Then, of course, you're going to review, modify, and test your code. Um, obviously, any objects uh, whose types are derived from documents in V5 are going to need to be replaced. Uh, again, you know those documents don't exist in V6, so we're going to look at some code here shortly to see what some of those differences are. Uh, in the case of some of the um, some of the scripting and some of the code that you use in part design, for example, uh, we will see examples where it's exactly the same uh, syntax in V6 as it was in V5. In other case, there's significant changes. Uh, when I go into the manufacturing workbenches, uh, programs that I had from manufacturing in V5, uh, so far I found I need to rewrite in V6. I, uh, early on I tried to uh, do some migration and realized, uh, you know, other than the logic in the program, pretty much all accessing the V6 uh, uh, data for manufacturing change, so that required more significant, significant changes than uh, programs for uh, you know things like part design and so on. All right, we'll take a deeper look into Visual Studio for applications. VSTA provides a development framework and a light version of Visual Studio, which is integrated which is an integrated development environment, or IDE it's referred to. So if you, ha if you uh, purchase the Visual Studio uh, product from Microsoft, um, the integrated development environment then lets you create user interfaces and you can then build um, programs within that environment, e even using different languages. Uh, with VSTA, it comes with Katia. It's installed with Katia. Uh, you no longer you have a subset of what Visual Studio is. So this uh, light version of the uh, Visual Studio IDE is then available uh, for access within Katia and Delmia uh, workbenches. Uh, the data, however, if you do have all of Visual Studio, uh, you can move it outside of Katia if you want to work on. Uh, Visual Studio external to Katia, this uh, this integrated development environment works inside of Katia or Delmia applications, as you'll see here in a minute. VSTA also provides uh, .NET access capabilities, whereas uh, uh, VBA is limited to COM objects. COM was uh, uh, the common object model, uh, and you were limited in VBA and still are in VBA and V6 to uh, COM objects, whereas VSTA is accessing .NET uh, objects. And the VSTA runtime works in both 32-bit and 64-bit client-server environments. Um, VBA is basically 32-bit, even though you know, I use it in V6 on a 30 or on a 62-bit, 64-bit uh, machine. Um, it runs fine, but uh, realize you're using it in 32-bit mode, whereas VSTA um, supports 64-bit. VSTA also provides a more powerful customization tool set than. Uh, VBA or CatScript or VBScript. Uh, I mentioned earlier that CatScript and VBScript really don't contain much in the way of uh, creating user interfaces. Uh, simple input field is all either one is capable of. Um, VBA expands on that and you can create um, user forms and more elaborate inputs and outputs from um, your VB scripts, but uh, VSTA then being a subset of Visual Studio, um, so far can, from what I've seen contains most of what's in uh, Visual Studio. 
if you're familiar with that tool. Uh, furthermore, again, it supports dot, both VB.NET and C Sharp languages. Um, so if you're interested in getting into C Sharp as a, a language that's available, uh, it's a, it was developed by Microsoft. It's one of the languages available in uh, Visual Studio. So now supported by VSTA as well. All right, a couple of slides here on the process you would go through to create a new VSTA library. Uh, they call them libraries. We call them libraries in V5 for VBA. Um, this is similar. Uh, so in this case, uh, again, it's almost identical to how we accessed uh, macros in V5 from the Tools pull-down menu. You'll select Tools, Macro, and Macros. You'll notice here that there's a, uh, a hot key to get to that functionality, which is Alt plus F8 to get into the uh, macros panel. You actually can use uh, Alt plus F12 and go straight into the VSTA or Visual Studio Tools for Applications uh, functionality as well. But I'm going to use the uh, standard macros functionality to uh, create a macro library for VSTA. So then once in the Macros dialog box, you can select the uh, Macro Libraries button. That th will then take us into the uh, Macro Libraries dialog box. From the Macros Library dialog box, um, first of all, on the um, library type, we're going to select that we want a uh, PLM VSTA project from the library type uh, drop-down box. Once in a VSTA uh, library type, we're going to say create new library. Um, when you select this then under VSTA, it will uh, bring up a second dialog box that wants to know what language do you want this particular library to support. So the library itself is set up to support either C Sharp or VB. And then once you select the library that, of choice, um, you can specify, the, under the New Library dialog box, you specify the, um, the library name. You can put it in a description field if you choose, and you click Finish, and then uh, it'll take a few seconds while it then creates this library back in the uh, Novia database. Moving on to the V6 documentation. Unlike V5, uh, the V5 automation documentation was available in the V5 help docs. That is no longer the case in V6. Um, so you need to uh, browse down into where your uh, client is installed on your client machine and to access the, uh, the uh, documentation for uh, automation. So in the default location on the 64-bit machine, uh, whatever path you use down under Program Files and Dasso Systems and then the release level, um, so this uh, B212 would be for the uh, 2012X release of V6. And then since it was 64-bit, we still use Intel A for 32-bit and Win underscore B64 for 64-bit machines under the code bin directory. If you sort through the many files that are found under the uh, in the bin folder, uh, you will find three different uh, compiled HTML help files. The v5automation.chm file, I've crossed it out here because the file exists, but it's basically empty. I'm not sure why it's there. But the other two files have uh, information in them. And the bulk of the information about V6 automation is found under the dsyautomation.chm file. What I typically do with this file is you can right-click and you can say send to desktop, where it'll se or send a shortcut to the desktop, and uh, or any other folder you choose, and you can uh, put a, a shortcut on your desktop to access this file, or you can certainly copy and paste this file in other locations.
once you double click on that file it opens it up and uh, you'll see a structure uh, portion of the structure here we're taking a look at um, so we have a list of con contents you can also do searches within the uh, within the help document and uh, browse through here so we're going to take a quick look at some of the foundation objects there's a bunch of uh, found foundation objects model maps. There's maps of various um, groupings of, of objects and so on we'll look at on the next page. So a few things I wanted to point out. Again, this gets back to the point I, I mentioned earlier about the, um, the fact that documents now don't exist inside of V6. Here under application, we notice we have, um, we have editors and an editor. So editors, as you might imagine, is a uh, collection of various editors. Those are our workbenches that we work in. So when we're in part design, we're accessing an editor that has access to the part design objects and so on. Uh, on the right-hand side of this map, you'll notice that we have uh, service, and we have a number of different services that are available. So where in V5, we would have had a document we want to, or from the documents collection, we want to do documents.open or documents.save. In the case of accessing the database, we're going to use a particular service. So if we're creating a new part object, for example, we would use the PLM new service. If we're opening up an existing object, we would use the PLM open service. And of course, propagate is to save that data back to the database. So there's a number of services that we have access to that we need to access to uh, both read and write the access, or you know, that have the access from the database to get to that data. Some of the obje other objects that we will see here are the same as in V5, and of course, these are color coded to show uh, same as it was under the V5 automation documentation. Uh, cover, the colors themselves have changed, but the uh, light blue or cyan color here for uh, objects themselves, the abstract objects that we see in the pinker shade and uh, yellow objects for collections. So looking down into the documentation, these are examples I extracted right out of the documentation. So you have an idea, first of all, of the syntax, but second of all, uh, there is some valuable information within the documentation. Uh, in this particular case, we see how um, we would access the, or declare or set an object that was e equal to the parent of a part object. And then we, um, then a message box is used to uh, display the, uh, the type name of that object. You'll notice that in V6, the syntax is exactly the same. So in this particular example, nothing changed. And if you had a script already that was doing that, uh, that portion of it would run as is. On the other hand, when we um, access documents in V5, we know that uh, anything that has reference to a document is going to change. So this is showing um, here in a couple of different steps, the fact that we uh, have a, uh, a variable that's set to a path and a particular file. And then when we want to, in this case, open that, we use the documents collection and we use the open method to open the file that's at this path and file name. When we look at the same thing in V6, you will notice it takes uh, a bit more uh, scripting because first we have to get the appropriate service. So in this case, we're getting a, sections, a session service for PLM search. First, we have to be able to search Inovia and find the object that we want to open. So we declare the search. We set the search, in this case, the, the search object. Um, and then from the searches collection, we're adding a new search. Once we have this new search, we have to add the various criteria of how we want to find a particular object. 
uh, unlike just giving it the name, you can still look for it just by name. Um, from the database, we have a lot more capabilities on um, how many different criteria we want to search, when it was created, what revision level it's at, um, who authored it, a variety of different things. In this particular case, uh, we're looking for a product. Um, it, it, the search, in fact, may come up with more than one result. So the results from the search are brought into a collection of entities. And this is how we both declare and uh, set this entities collection equal to our search results. And then once we have the search results, again, if we wanted to open one of the objects from the search, we um, have to access the PLM open service to open the, the, one of the results or all of the results if you wanted to do that. So first, we, first of all, we get the uh, open service. And then once we have the open service, we issue the, uh, uh, the method, which is a PLM open. On the, from the entities collection, we're grabbing entity item number one. So the first entity on the list of returned entities. Uh, you could also do a test to make sure that it found a result. So this is just showing at a minimum the steps it would need to essentially open one particular uh, object from the Inovia database. Saving the object, uh, although the uh, syntax changes slightly, um, we can still specify that on the, on the, in a single line. On the top, we see we just simply tell it we want to save the active document. Uh, again, in the case of V6, we're ac accessing the, uh, the session service, which is the PLM propagate service, and giving it the save method. So that'll uh, save your data back to the database. Creating objects, uh, similarly, we see V5 on top. And on the bottom, we see that uh, within V6, again, we have to first uh, get the session service for the PLM new service. Once we have the new service, we can issue a method, which is a PLM create. In this case, we're creating a 3D shape. By the way, this is what we call a part in V6. It's a 3D shape. And this method and this service returns the editor now that um, has this part opened in it. So they've declared the editor as an editor, and we use the service to um, uh, create a new 3D shape or a part object. OK, so that brings us to uh, the last section of my presentation in which case I will uh, show um, three examples of uh, programs running, the first of which I'll run a uh, title block program. Uh, again, be aware that there are some sample title block scripts that can be found in CATIA uh, in your V6 installation. So under uh, this, in this case, it was under the WinB64, so a 64-bit environment there's a VB script folder, and there's a frame and title block programs inside that uh, that you can look at. Uh, the comments, last time I looked, the comments are in French. It was developed by Dassault, but if you want to uh, convert those, you could follow through the logic that they used. Uh, certainly, that's not the only method, and the method that I'm going to present is uh, a fair amount different than the ones, the scripts that run from Dassault. Uh, next, I'm going to run a uh, program that I compiled actually externally in Microsoft Visual Studio. So it's a, once, once you compile it, it's an EXE program that still accesses the current session of uh, V6, much the same way we did with V5. And lastly, I thought I would show you how to uh, record a macro into a uh, VSTA library, and then we will uh, take a quick look at, at uh, some of that code. Although, okay, with that, I'm going to, uh, let's see, open up my V6 session. And you should see my display, and I've already opened up a drawing. 
So again, from the tools pull down menu, and the other thing I should say is it is possible to create your own toolbars and add icons, and if you're accessing these functions on a repetitive basis, uh, you may want to create a toolbar with icons instead of as accessing these uh, automation scripts or programs from tools macro macros. So the first one that I want to run is a uh, a VBA project in V6, and uh, I'm going to run this script. So it's a matter of since I've I'm already uh, have the your settings by the way. Remember what uh, what macro libraries you use, and you can have several on the list. In this particular case, it remembered the last one I used, and I want to run this script. So what this script does when I run it is it looks at the drawing format. It, um, it says, well, this is a B-size page, so it will present various B-size formats that I have uh, previously f defined. And if I want to use that format, I can press the OK button, in which case it, it uh, queries the database for that format. Uh, so it will read that format, and then it, it also reads data not only from the drawing format and the drawing itself, but it accesses data that what's within the uh, this happened to be an assembly, so it reads data from the assembly, and uh, and then it it presents that data into this page. In which case, I can uh, make modifications to this. So from the data that it read, I can make these whatever changes I want to in the text itself. And uh, once I say OK here, it will then. Uh, uh, open up the background of this drawing and it'll place this uh, title block drawing and uh, frame and title block in the background so uh, just like you would interactively but obviously it does it quite quickly and then the data that we accessed you'll notice um, you know the part number and the title in this particular case it was coming out of the uh, the assembly itself and then other data comes from the drawing and other data I can uh, modify within the uh, interface in the script. All right, so that's one example. Uh, let's see, next I'm going to uh, close this. So you'll notice here where in V5 we had a start menu, we have uh, PLM access, and I can simply close this data. I don't want to propagate it. There's the model data for that particular part. Uh, let's just close that as well. And I'm going to perform a search. So now I'm going to look for some uh, NC data. So it's a uh, PPR context is what we call uh, process objects within V6. And I want to look for one that begins with uh, MFG. And you can put asterisks in there to do a wildcard search. And I want to open up this uh, this object. Now I'm working out of the Seattle area, and my database is at our IDEX office down in Portland, so um, access to my database is as fast as my internet connection, but the nice thing is I can access this data anywhere. I frequently do from as I travel from hotels or customer sites. Okay. And this data opened up, so it's an existing NC program. Uh, if you recognize the part, it's it's a part that's in the uh, training materials. And so we have a, a number of different machining operations and tool tool changes, tool descriptions, and so on. So I want to run a uh, a script that uh, again is an executable, and it was a program that I used as a training example. Uh, in V5 for accessing the um, manufacturing objects. And I wanted to uh, port that over to V6 to get an idea on uh, the changes in accessing those objects um, you know, between V5 and V6. So this is, again, external. I'm going to double click on this executable to launch it. Uh, the interface certainly isn't anything fancy. It's simply a, a list box that I'm going to list the objects that I access. But when I select the Read button, 
it's reading through this um, NC program, and it's extracting data about everything that took place in here. So as we look down through here, it found uh, the first part operation, which was named the default name, part operation.1. It had no comment field uh, that was displayed, so the comment was empty. Uh, the part operation accesses a machine. Uh, so there's various parameters in here for how the settings in the machine itself were made. Um, then it goes down into the first manufacturing program. Uh, the other thing that I should mention here is if that I had uh, objects in here that were deactivated, for example, I could deactivate a manufacturing program, uh, that data would not display because it knows enough to ignore features that are, uh, that are deactivated. So these were all active objects. And um, then it went into a tool change, was the next thing on the, on the uh, process list. So um, this particular tool had a tool assembly, so it gives me tool assembly parameters. Further down, it was an end mill. It gives me the tool parameters uh, for the tool itself. And then furthermore, it gives me holder parameters. So for, and it will do this for all of the data that was associated to that tool assembly. In V6, unlike V5, we have the ability to uh, stack holders and extensions together, whereas in V5 we had one tool and one holder, um, so there could be uh, much more data available here. Uh, then it goes through each of the operations themselves. This roughing operation was active, so the activity shows up as being true. Uh, if it were false, it would then skip the rest of the data because that activity had been deactivated. So we can look at all the parameters that generated the tool path and so on. So I won't spend a lot of time with this, but the, uh, the main result of the exercise is that I realized that other than the, the logic within my program in how to loop through part operations and how to loop through manufacturing programs and machining operations and so forth, um, all of the syntax for accessing the objects in V6 has changed in manufacturing. I don't know if that's a result of now that manufacturing falls under the Delmia brand versus Katia or not, but uh, I do know that the uh, program changed uh, significantly. Okay, and then we'll go back here into my Katia session. In my last example, uh, that will conclude the presentation is I want to create a new part object. So in this case, I've asked for a new part, and I will leave it as a default name. So that's how we create a new empty part, much the same as we would have in V5. Now I want to go in and create a script, but the script I want to create will be a um, VSTA project, so I can go into uh, tools, macro, macros, for example, and I can switch from my VBA project um, and switch to a, a VSTA project. And uh, with that being uh, active, the VSTA project, if I say uh, start recording, you'll notice it will um, access the currently active library, which is my VSTA project. This one was set up to record in VB, so it shows me my, the language that I'm using. And um, uh, this is the name of the script that I want to create. So we'll say start. I guess I have to start. There's some uh, requirements here in the macro name, macro demo. How about that? Okay, so then just like V5, we get a new icon that shows up in a toolbar, which is the stop button. So I'm going to keep this real simple. Uh, on the XY plane, I'm going to go in and create a sketch. So the sketcher comes up. Within the sketch, I'm going to uh, simply sketch a rectangle. I will exit the sketch. It is important when you're recording that when you create a sketch, you need to exit the sketch. If you only wanted the sketch recorded, 
you need to create the sketch and exit the sketcher before you stop recording. In this case, I'm going to go on a couple of more steps. I'm going to create a pad from this and say OK to that. And then on one of the corners, I want to create a fillet. And I'll use the default fillet radius and say OK to that. And then that's all I'm going to record. So in this case, I tell it to stop. And uh, I have the macro recorded. So if I close this and don't propagate to the database, and the only reason I'm closing it is I just want to show you that uh, then you could run that in any part. So if I create another new part and want to run the existing script, if I go to Tools, Macro, Macros, that script show will show up on my list. Um, and if I select Run, actually I got a, oh, uh, <laughs> this was actually an earlier version of the script. I didn't see it on my list. I've been in and out of the database all morning, so I have to check that. But because uh, this one came up taller, I know, and the name was different. But let's take a look at the macro itself. Uh, so I'm going to go into the edit functionality. And yeah, this was an earlier script for that I was just trying out here this morning, actually. Uh, there are some line items here that get recorded that I actually commented out. You have the ability here to uh, comment these things. But I wanted to just show the structure of this for, uh, for a minute here, and then I'll conclude. Um, first of all, you notice it's, a, it's uh, declaring an editor, and then it, uh, you, it sets that editor as the .active editor. So the active editor I was in was part design. So when you record a script, of course, it doesn't do any checking to see um, is your active editor accessing a part or is it a product or what. If you want to add that logic to this, you can. Um, we uh, declare, it declares a, uh, a part object, and then it gets the active object, which hopefully that, that would pass as long as you had a, uh, the uh, active editor was accessing a part. And then it, it gets the bodies collection. And of course, it creates the first body, which is a part body. Um, and then it declares the sketches collection, because you could have multiple sketches and so on. So from the sketches collection, we create uh, an origin. And then it uses that origin, uh, defines it as a reference. And the, that reference is on the uh, plane XY. So that's where I sketched on. And then within the sketches collection, it's adding a new sketch using this reference, the XY plane, as the uh, reference. So now we've created the sketch. Uh, you need to set up your axes. You'll notice the syntax of this looks very much the same as it did in V5. So other than the fact that in V5 we were accessing documents, now we're using the um, the editor, so that's one thing that changed. But the rest of this code, you will notice, is uh, very similar as a recording that we would have done in uh, V5. We still use factory do 2D to create 2D objects within the sketch. Uh, the sketch is absolute axis and horizontal vertical directions. And then I won't go through all of the rest of this because I'll run over, over time, which I'm approaching the limit now. But uh, we see the lines and points that made up the rectangle. When we get down to the bottom here, you will notice there's a couple of constraints, four constraints actually, that got created to constrain those lines horizontally and vertically. And then when it does the sketch one dot close addition, that's exiting the sketch. The sketch becomes the in-work object. The part is updated. And the next thing we do is create a shape factory. Again, same as in V5 to create the pad, and uh, this actually creates add new pad. So that created the pad. We, we again update our part. And then remember, I added a fillet radius last. 
So this creates a reference for the fillet, which is the corner that I selected. The fillet is added, and then after the fillet is added, the radius is changed in the fillet. And, um, and, then, the, and then lastly, the part is updated. So that's how the script, uh, how the script was run. All right. So back to uh, my last slide. Thanks everyone for uh, attending today's session. Uh, look for more sessions, webinars uh, from IDEX, in, uh, which will be coming soon. I don't, don't have the schedule, but uh, Nick will be mailing those out. And if you have questions, since I'm running late here, uh, you're welcome to uh, submit questions to my uh, email address, which is shown here, WesRussell at IDEXSolutions.com. Once again, thanks everybody. Hey, Wes. Yes. Wes, are you able to take yes. any questions if anybody wants to stay on? Uh, if they want to stay on, I'm available here for a few minutes. Okay, great. Does, um, does anybody have any questions for Wes right now? Um, on the uh, computer that we have, uh, the V5, can we have a V6 as well? Yes. As a matter of fact, the, I'm running on a laptop right now that you watch this presentation on, and I have, I have three versions of V5 and four releases of V6 installed on it. Oh, so, okay. So we can we can still use the uh, we can save the uh, V5 as a reference for our previous uh, data files that we have, and uh, um, go to the. Uh, uh, v V6 um, when you know we are working with the uh, with another product or so. Yes, that's certainly. Uh, I mean, I switch back and forth because obviously we still have a lot of customers on V5 and we have some customers on V6. So, uh, matter of fact, that's one of the reasons why I have so many uh, different releases of both V5 and V6 installed. Um, that I, in a lot of cases, I need to access the data from the same release the customer is on. Okay, thank you very much. It was a good good presentation. I really appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Does anyone else have questions? Well, if not, I want to thank everybody for joining the webinar today, and we will be in touch with you regarding the next session. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, Wes. Thanks, Wes. All right, you're welcome.